Welcome to Soundtrack Your Life, a podcast about soundtracks, music, and movies. Each episode features a guest and focuses on a specific soundtrack and the personal stories connected to it. Now here's your host, Ryan Pack. Welcome to Soundtrack Your Life. I'm Ryan Pack, and this is a podcast where I interview a guest about a soundtrack that they feel personally connected to. Today, I will be talking to Peter Gardner, writer, director, actor, and owner of Shadowlight Entertainment. Peter often chimes in with some great facts and stories about some of the films that we cover on the Soundtrack Your Life Instagram, which you can follow at Soundtrack Cast if you haven't already. Today, we're going to talk about the 1981 Steven Spielberg film, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Peter, why are we talking about this film today? Uh, well, first of all, Ryan, thank you for having me. Um, and it's great to be here. Uh, we're talking about Raiders of the Lost Ark, not Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, oh, sorry, my mistake. They, they, at some point, they retitled it. For, <laughs> at some point, they retitled it for marketing purposes. So I'm just teasing you. But um, it was originally Raiders of the Lost Ark. We are talking about it, um, well, for several reasons. Um, one, it's the 40th anniversary of Raiders of the Lost Ark. It'll be the 40th anniversary on June 12th, as a matter of fact. Um, it is considered to be, um, by many, one of the greatest films ever made, one of the greatest adventure films ever made. And by Spiel Steven Spielberg fans, um, one of the greatest Steven Spielberg films ever made. Um, it uh, led to a franchise that's given us so far uh three sequels and there's one in the works keeps getting pushed back a little bit but i know that it's coming and um it's one of my favorite films for sure it, i mean it is up there and uh, as as you usually got uh with steven spielberg films whenever a new steven spielberg film came out you also got a great john williams films uh score rather so it was a two for it and uh is some of those scores were just fantastic and Raiders of the Lost Ark is certainly one of those. So um, where would you like me to begin, Ryan? Well, I think, you know, John Williams is a good place to start. Would you like to know about his collaboration with Steven Spielberg? Yeah, I would absolutely love to hear about that. Being a soundtrack podcast, I feel like at some point we got to talk about John Williams, right? Well, well yeah, exactly. Well, I think it, it would be appropriate if we talked about that and soundtracks and, and Steven Spielberg and everything. Steven Spielberg himself was a huge soundtrack collector, and he always said that he had a huge collection. And like a lot of us that have collected soundtracks, and I was a big soundtrack collector when I was starting from when I was a kid, you, you move or something happens and you end up getting rid of a lot of your vinyl. And then of course, now we all regret doing that, but, um, or they come out on CD or what have you, but Steven Spielberg was a big soundtrack collector and he heard a uh, John Williams score from a film from 1969, I believe called the Reavers, which is a fantastic score for a film uh, directed by Mark, Mike, Mark Rydell who uh, then did The Cowboys and did another had another great John Williams score. Spielberg said he went a little crazy when he heard the score from the Reavers and wondered who John Williams was and researched it and found out he had scored some other films in the 60s that he'd really liked. Uh, so when Steven Spielberg got his first chance to direct his first theatrical feature was The Sugarland Express in 1974, he wanted to hire John Williams and they went to lunch. And John Williams was completely disarmed because Steven Spielberg had never seen a, a wine list before. He just had <laughs> never seen it. And he said he was, John Williams described Steven Spielberg in that first meeting as he was a breath of fresh air. And they, it started a collaboration. Uh, Mr. Spielberg's directed, I think over 40 films and John Williams has scored all but three and a quarter of them. And he's the, the quarter being a, a movie twilight Zone, the movie that had four episodes and Steven Spielberg directed one of the episodes, and that score was done by Jerry Goldsmith, another great composer, Hollywood composer, and he was a great choice for that project because he had done TV shows. But that started their collabor collaboration, the Sugarland Express, uh, Spielberg's first theatrical feature that he directed for features. His TV movie Duel was ultimately released in theaters, but Sugarland Express was the first one he directed just uh, that was going to go directly into theaters. And then, of course, then came Jaws, uh, and one of the greatest scores ever written for motion pictures, I think. Uh, I personally was a fan of John Williams even before 
he really became almost the household name of Star Wars. And that was kind of, and and Jaws, Jaws was a score that people really noticed. But then I think the Star Wars score, which is phenomenal, of course, um, Mm -hmm. and was a huge seller when that double soundtrack album came out in 1977 uh, and was the top selling soundtrack of that was just a symphonic score. No other album that was just a symphonic score had sold that much. But I loved some of the John Williams stuff that had, he had done earlier. He did the adaptation of uh, the film version of Fiddler on the Roof in 1971 that was excellent. You know, the great Broadway show. He did a film that I feel is kind of forgotten, but it's great. It was a 1973 version of Tom Sawyer, which was a musical. And the songs were written by the Sherman Brothers, the great songwriting team that did all the great Disney stuff like Mary Poppins. And then they also did Chitty Chitty Bang Bang uh, and uh, Charlotte's Web from the 1970s and many, many other great things. So they wrote the songs and John Williams scored that film. And that was just a fantastic score. One of the specialty soundtrack labels, uh, Quartet, released a remastering of it a few years ago where they had an expanded version of the original soundtrack. Then they also included this, the score behind the songs without the lyrics. So you could just hear the orchestrations. And it, it's phenomenal. And, and, and I really enjoy that movie as well. It's, it feels like a Disney movie, but it's not a Disney movie. Disney didn't make it, but it's really good. So I, and then John Williams went on to score soon after that, the great disaster movies of the 70s, Towering Inferno, which we actually did a year before Tom Sawyer. I, no, I'm sorry, Poseidon Adventure was a year before, uh, in 1972. Then in 1974, he did Towering Inferno. He did Earthquake in 1974. So the disaster films, I don't know if you're familiar with them, but they were a series of very popular films in the 70s where there was some kind of big disaster that happened and you had an all-star cast. And the big question was, who was going to survive, which star was going to make it. <laughs> and you could kind of tell from the bigger the star, they were probably going to make it. But there were some surprises along the way. Another great soundtrack company, La La Land Records, a year ago released uh, a box set of all the great disaster scores that John Williams did. So I bought that right away, of course, because uh, being a big John Williams fan. So getting back to Spielberg's collaboration with them, they worked on many films. And then when... George Lucas and Steven Spielberg went to Hawaii when Star Wars opened because George Lucas wanted to get away what he thought was going to be a failure when Star Wars opened. And John Williams had scored uh, Star Wars at Steven Spielberg's recommendation. And they went to the Mauna Kea Hotel uh, in Hawaii, the big island of Hawaii. And of course, they found out that Star Wars was this phenomenal hit to everyone's surprise. And they were on the beach building a sandcastle. And George Lucas said to Steven Spielberg, his good buddy, what do you want to do next? And he said, well, United Artists came to me and I uh, said, you can do anything you want. We'll let you do direct anything you want. And he said, well, I want to direct a James Bond picture. And they said, anything other than James Bond, what do you want to direct? Because that was like their big franchise. and They had the directors that were working it. And George Lucas said, I have something better than Bond. And he told him about an idea that he'd come up in 1973, come up with in 1973 about an adventure archaeologist that went around looking for artifacts and some of them had a mystical quality to them. And he said, oh, really? He said, yeah, his name is Indiana Smith. And uh, Steven Spielberg said, I like everything except the name Smith. And uh, it's too common. He goes, okay, we'll call him Indiana Jones. He said, all right. And they started talking about ideas and and things that they were going to do. And then they said, you know, it's the most important part of this. And at the same time, they said, we'll get John Williams to do the music. And then they went to lunch. (laughs) So at that point, they were big John Williams fans after he did such a great job on their work thus far. So that's uh, how Steven Spielberg became involved with Raiders of the Lost Ark. And then, of course, they asked John Williams to score it. And he did. My personal connection to Raiders of the Lost Ark, I think the first time I heard about it was I was reading in Variety. And I was, you know, a kid. I was a big movie buff. And so now I'm in high school and it's uh, my junior year in high school. And John Williams in 1979, 1980 is taking over the Boston Pops Orchestra. And there was an article in Variety about him doing that. And they said his next film is going to be for Steven Spielberg and George Lucas Raiders. That's all it said was Raiders. And I perked up immediately because that was a huge thing. The fact that George Lucas and Steven Spielberg were collaborating, you know, they had never worked together before. And 
that was that was a huge thing. I found out later that it was a huge thing when they took the project around. They had decided to make the greatest deal that anybody had ever got. And on notebook paper, they outlined the terms of the deal that they wanted. And every studio was kind of slightly outraged. They were also kind of intrigued because, again, it was a collaboration of George Lucas and Steven Spielberg. It was Michael Eisner who was running Paramount Pictures, later he ran Disney, who uh, said it was an unmakeable deal, but we had to do it. Uh, they wanted, you know, uh, upfront money from the box office returns, and the studio really wasn't going to see any money till a little later on, but they wanted the studio to put up all the money. It was just unheard of and had never been done. When Michael Eisner agreed to the deal, a lot of people said, you guys are getting shafted. And Michael Eisner said, if we're getting shafted, I'd like to be shafted did like this three or four times a year, uh, knowing that, you know, with their track record, they were going to do something really special. He'd also read the script by Lawrence Kasdan and thought it was one of the greatest scripts ever. So that was when I first heard about Raiders and, and I just was so intrigued. And then Steven Spielberg mentioned it in another, uh, in an interview he did when he had a, uh, the movie 1941 coming out or soon after. And then they released some artwork and some pictures of, the character of Indiana Jones, which had not been cast yet. And there was these great uh, pictures that showed this, this character and these situations where he's facing snakes and he's jumping from a, from a horse onto a truck and he's in the desert and he looked like the Marlboro man because they hadn't really come up with the costume yet. And um, they were just spectacular. So my excitement sure was building. And then, uh, all I could talk about was this movie before it was coming out. And so now we're like six months before I'm a senior in high school and um, I'm talking about this movie and it really didn't have a lot of awareness. Like people weren't really looking out for it or waiting for it. I think in the industry they did and big film nuts like me really did, but it was uh, something that was not as highly anticipated to say the next star Wars film or empire strikes back when that had come out a year earlier, but finally it was time for Raiders to open they used to do this thing, Ryan, where they would have sneak previews. Like a couple of weeks before a movie was released, they would show it in a theater before. And they'd tell you what it was, but it was like at, it, well, they'd show it once at like 8 o'clock at night on a Saturday. And if it was really a highly anticipated film, you'd have to sit through the movie before that was playing that you probably had already seen because it had been out for a while. And then finally get to the movie you waited for so it was Memorial Day weekend, I think, of 1981 that they were going to show Raiders of the Lost Ark in one of these sneak previews. And I, we had our theater banquet, <laughs> our high school theater banquet, and I had to go to that. And so I didn't, this movie I'd been looking forward to for a year and a half, I couldn't go. A couple of friends had gone and they just said it was phenomenal. And the reviews started to come out. So on June 12th, 1981, uh, I finished my last high school final of my life. And myself and several friends loaded into a couple cars and we went to the National Theater in Westwood, which was a great theater. It's now gone in Westwood, California. And because I always had to see everything in the best theaters with the best sound. And uh, we saw the 5.30 p.m. showing of Raiders of the Lost Ark. And to say that it did not disappoint <laughs> was an understatement. And I was a big soundtrack collector and a huge John Williams fan. And I didn't like to hear the score before I actually saw the movie. It was you know, kind of a spoiler. So what I would do is get the soundtrack on vinyl and keep it at home, go see the film. And then as soon as I got home from the film or the very next day, I would record the soundtrack on one playing onto a, a audio cassette. That way the album never degenerated the vinyl. And I always had that cassette that you could play in the car or on your home tape deck, which is what we listened to back then. And that score was just fantastic. The original soundtrack, soundtrack release of Raiders was on Columbia Records, and it ran about 44 minutes of music. They've since expanded it several times, and the latest being in 2008, where um, they came up um, with the fantastic box set that has all four soundtracks. And the um, Indiana Jones and the Crystal Skull had just come out. And uh, so they didn't really touch that one, but the other three, they expanded and added some material that wasn't there before. And it's a great set. So that's kind of the beginning of my lifelong love of Raiders of the Lost Ark and all things Indiana Jones. So there you go. Are you still there, Ryan? 
Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I read that during 1981 that the industry as a whole was kind of lagging a little bit. And so, You're right. it so was uh, Raiders uh, and I believe Superman 2 kind of gave it this huge shot in the arm. Absolutely. they uh, The industry was in a little bit of a slump, but that summer, uh, the films did very well. You had Raiders, which opened on June 12th. Superman 2 opened the following week. Now, that was highly anticipated because it was a sequel to a blockbuster hit that had come out years before. And that was not, uh, December of 1978 when Superman opened. So now we're about two and a half years later. Of course, that was the uh, a Richard Lester cut, the directed film. And we thought it was a pretty good sequel. Well, of course, later on, we got a much better sequel with the Richard Donner cut. Richard Donner, of course, there's a whole story of how he was let go from the filming of Superman 2 and uh, Richard Lester took over. But Superman 2 was very good. There were some other big films that did uh, well that summer. There was uh, Mel Brooks' film History of the World Part 1. Clash of the Titans opened the same day as Raiders. Not the remake, but the original one with um, Mark Hamill and uh, Laurence Olivier uh, with the Ray Harryhausen special effects. And uh, there were several others. The real... Uh, now, I'll get to Raiders in the box office in a second, but the real sleeper that summer is a great film, Arthur, uh, starring Dudley Moore. Are you familiar with it? By name, but I don't think I've seen it. I, I contend that it's like the best romantic comedy and the funniest romantic comedy. Uh, that's There hasn't been one that good made since. There's been some good ones, but it's outstanding. There was a remake, of course, years later. That wasn't as good, but it was a wonderful film, hilarious with Dudley Moore and Liza Minnelli and John Gilgood and written and directed by a man by the name of Steve Gordon, who passed away very young right after that film was made. And I always wondered, you know, what other wonderful films he would have made. I think he was a TV writer and that was his first film and it's just brilliant. But that was the real sleeper. Raiders, like I said, wasn't and as highly as anticipated as some of the other films. But word of mouth started to strike as soon as people started to see it, starting with that Saturday night preview. Because I remember schoolmates of mine in high school, Calabasas High School, came and said, we just saw this movie and it was unbelievable. And, and they didn't know anything about it. They didn't, you know, they weren't looking forward to it. Maybe they had heard me mention it. And uh, they went to go see it and they thought it was fantastic. And people just started talking about it. And people started to go seeing it again and again and again. And it just built an audience and it had incredible legs as they call it it played in some theaters well they took it officially out of release in like march of the following year which is a long time it played in some theaters continuously and then they re-released it about a year later and then again in 1983 and um you know this is before home video so we didn't have a you know at home if you want to see raiders of the lost ark you had to go to the theater or anything else for that matter and it just had incredible, incredible legs. And it was the number one grossing film of 1981. Won a few Academy Awards in the technical areas. It was nominated for, I believe it was nominated for Best Picture and Steven Spielberg was nominated. I can't remember if he was or not, but um, it, uh, it was just great. You know, the amazing thing about it is it has not aged. If you watch it now, I think because it takes place in 1936, there's nothing in it that ages. You know, there's not, you watch some of these phones where somebody steps into a phone booth or is maybe on a computer and they're on AOL dial up or whatever it is. You know, it's, some of these things have not held up, but Raiders is just, it plays uh, as well now as it did back then in 1981. Have you seen, you've, obviously you've seen it, right? I'm assuming, right? Of course. Of course. Okay. Well, I love that answer. It's just, it's a great screenplay by Lawrence Kasdan. It who's is also known great. for writing Empire of the, who's also known for writing Empire Strikes Back. Well, if you, if you don't know the story behind that was, a, a, he was a copywriter in the advertising business in Chicago. And he was trying to, he hated advertising. He was trying to break in the movie business. So he wrote a spec script, meaning, you know, you write it, you try to sell it, and try to get an agent. He wrote a, a, he loved the comedies of the 1930s that were kind of romantic sparring comedies. So he tried to write one. It was called Continental Divide. And it got to Steven Spielberg's attention. Steven Spielberg read it, liked it. He bought it. And when George Lucas and Steven Spielberg got serious soon after that little trip to Hawaii, 
about uh, developing it, Steven Spielberg thought that um, Lawrence Kasdan would be the guy for the job because this movie was set in 1936. He had written this movie, Continental Divide, which kind of evoked those films from 1936. If you watch the film now, as it turned out, you would never get that, but the original script kind of did. And uh, so they hired him and they sat in 1978. They sat in George Lucas's uh, assistant, Jane Bay's house in the San Fernando Valley and for three days hashed out all these kinds of different ideas for what would be in this movie. And then it was Lawrence Kasdan's job to go and take that, come up with a narrative, come up with all the characters and all the details, which he did brilliantly in six months. Some of those ideas wound up in Raiders. Some of them were cut and then wound up in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. But six months later, when he had finished the first draft of Raiders, uh, Lawrence Kasdan uh, went to go have lunch with George Lucas. And George Lucas told him that Lee Brackett, who had written the first draft of Empire Strikes Back, had just passed away. And he said, I'd like you to go ahead and take a crack at writing the screenplay and writing the next draft. And Lawrence Kasdan kind of looked at George Lucas sheepishly and said, don't you think you should read Raiders first? And George Lucas said, well, if I read Raiders tonight and hate it, I'll revoke this offer. And of course, there was no need to do that. And um, Lawrence Kasdan went and wrote a great script for Empire Strikes Back, which many people agree is the best Star Wars film. So right. it, it's certainly the most well-made, directed brilliantly by Irvin Kirshner. And again, another wonderful John Williams score and soundtrack. The great thing about um, Star Wars, the original one, uh, you, you'd probably call it episode four if you're calling it Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. But um, the, um, those two soundtracks were double albums. So you had about 75 minutes worth of music. Uh, so those, you had a lot of music from Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back. By the time they got to Return of the Jedi, for some reason, uh, it was only one album. But uh, still, again, a, a really good John Williams score. And, you know, he always did these wonderful themes. In Raiders, he, he comes up with great themes. First, of course, you have what's become known as the Raiders March on the soundtrack album on the original vinyl release. It opened with about a five minute piece that was uh, just called Raiders of the Lost Ark. And it was essentially... Uh, the what you hear in the end credits. The end, the end credits is uh, in Raiders of the Lost Ark. The music's been kind of edited, but you're getting the full version on that full soundtrack. It, and now it's kind of been shifted around a little bit in the subsequent releases. But the only place you can hear that great recording as it appeared is on that first soundtrack album. I think the other extra, there's two other extraordinary pieces from John Williams' score for Raiders of the Lost Ark. One is Marion's theme which uh, for Marion Ravenwood, played by Karen Allen, which Steven Spielberg said is straight out of the Warner Brothers classics. And it really is. It's just a beautiful thing. One of the most amazing things John Williams has done, and I kind of marvel at it, is, and believe it or not, it's in Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. It's not in the film, but he recorded re-recorded Marion's theme when she comes back in Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. And he and her, she they had not seen each other for several years and they had a son together that he didn't know about, of course. But he re-recorded the theme, but he added a little bridge that was new. And it's a little piece of music. And I don't know how he did it, but if you ask me, you listen to that piece and you can now find the recording a couple places. The bridge represents that passage of time and if you've ever had an old love that you later on have reconnected with or, uh, you know, time goes by or you've moved on to other people and, if you, you know, that happens, um, it, it, it so captured that. I don't know how he did it, but it was absolutely beautiful. And uh, so that's a great theme. The other great piece of music that's in uh, Raiders, I think, uh, is that fantastic eight minute truck chase that's in it when they load the arc onto the back of the truck. Uh, taking it to Cairo, and that's an eight-minute sequence that has no dialogue. There, you know, there's some yelling and screaming, uh, but it's mostly sound effects. But it's just all score uh, with the uh, uh, Indiana Jones theme interspersed and a lot of other things. And that's like eight minutes long. That sequence, the original soundtrack release in 1981 didn't have that full cut of music. It had most of it. Uh, there was a release later on that had the entire 
truck chase on it. So I think those are the three pieces that are great. There's also a, a, another one for, um, you know, when he's in the map room, it's just, it's, it's just a great, great John Williams score. As are, I think, the other scores for the other films as well. Uh, by the time they got to Last Crusade, uh, Steven Spielberg said in the liner notes on the soundtrack for Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade that he and John Williams felt that the movies had grown up enough that they didn't have to do the Indiana Jones theme every time he did something heroic or smashed somebody. Uh, it's still there, but they said that they kind of mellowed out or pulled back on it a little bit. So the summer of 81, I looked forward to Raiders of the Lost Ark, saw it, was not disappointed, and saw it more times in the theater than I could count. And over the years, I've met so, uh, many people uh, in the industry and uh, who are not in the industry who have loved it. And many of them went into the industry because of it. Lawrence Kaz and the screenwriter went on, of course, to have an amazing career as a writer director, making some great films. It's also the 40th anniversary of one of my favorite films of his body. Heat. And um, uh, there's just so many great people involved. My, good friend Michelle Nairi, who's a, a hair and makeup artist in the industry, she describes Raiders of the Lost Ark as the perfect film. And I think she's absolutely right. So John Williams was nominated for Best Score for he Raiders. He was. He lost, he lost to Vangelis and Chariots of Fire. If you, if, if, you don't, if you can't hear that score in your head right now as I say it, you have heard it many, many, many times. It was a unique score the film was about british uh, uh runners in the uh, i think the olympics in like the 1930s or something like that and it was this score that was very uh electronic and it had a very memorable theme and that's the one that won uh john williams is almost nominated every year for every score that he does you know and deservedly so and you know has won several times I believe he's I believe he's only won five times out of being nominated fifty two times. He's been nominated fifty two and he's won five. Yeah. I would have thought that it was more. I'm glad that there was no money involved in that because I would have bet that it was way more. Wow. He's only won five Oscars. I could have sworn it was a lot more. I bet he's got a lot of Grammys. I haven't yes. got the tally on that, but it's a lot. Very nice man, by the way. He's very nice. I must tell you that since we're celebrating the fortieth anniversary of Raiders. Five years ago, I was actually with Steven Spielberg and I turned to him and I said, it was, it was April. And it was, I said, before I forget, happy 35th anniversary on June 12th to Raiders of the Lost Ark. And he got this look on his face and he looked at me and he goes, oh, I didn't know that. You knew that and I didn't. And he, he had no idea. So it was really funny. But his feeling on Raiders is he says he has a hard time watching his own films because he sees all the mistakes and what they could have done differently. But he says Raiders of the Lost Ark in interviews, he said that it can, um, it's the one film he can watch with his kids and he can divorce himself from the making of it and just enjoy the film. So I guess he said that that's the gift that Raiders of the Lost Ark gives back to him. So even Steven Spielberg, who directed the film, is a big fan of Raiders of the Lost Ark. So there you go, right? That's awesome. Tell me when you first saw an Indiana Jones film, Ryan. Oh, so so I think I watched uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark as a kid, not in the theater. It might have been on TV or some, or maybe one of my siblings rented it. Right. Like, I can't remember the exact moment because I think by the time, you know, I was a kid that was able to process movies, like it had just become such a big part of pop culture where like you knew the Raiders theme or the Raiders March. You knew Raiders March without knowing the movie. Without knowing what it was. And that's kind of interesting because I, that didn't become iconic right away. I think that people, when star Wars opened in 1977, I remember that clearly that theme, I think you could whistle it when you were coming out. I don't know that the Indiana Jones theme or March was really as noticeable to a lot of people. It was certainly to me because I was immediately playing the soundtrack over and over again. A couple of years later in Lawrence Kasdan's film that he co-wrote and directed, The Big Chill, you know, all the friends are at a house. They're in town for a funeral and they're staying at this house and a bat gets loose in the house. And Kevin Klein grabs a tennis racket to go chase it. And he does the Raiders theme a little bit. 
when Kate Capshaw, now Steven Spielberg's wife, was in a film called Best Defense in 1983. That came out probably about nine months, I'm going to guess, before Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, which opened in May of 1984. She's kind of idly sitting in a car in this movie, Best Defense. And you know how you'll kind of hum in the car or kind of like absentmindedly, you know, do a theme in the car. She does the Indiana Jones theme. It was kind of an inside joke because nobody really knew who she was or that she was going to be in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. John Williams, of course, is for many years since about 1980, maybe even before, has appeared in the Hollywood Bowl every September. He started mostly playing uh, many of his scores and did some other pieces. But of course, that evolved when they got the capability to show clips and he would play live music along with it. And then ultimately later on, other other conductors have compo- have um, conducted the score to Raiders in its entirety while the movie is playing. So you could actually go see Raiders of the Lost Ark and hear the music live. And uh, it, it, in all those Indiana Jones films, the score is lengthy and it's there for a lot of it. It's interesting because there's some action pieces in Raiders of the Lost Ark where there's no score. When they have the big fight in the Ravenwood bar, when it burns down, there's no music in that. You would think there would be, but there isn't. But it's kind of good. I think that you have a little bit of a breather. But all of those films, uh, all four of them, introduce uh, new themes for new characters uh, that are great. I love even in Crystal Skull, uh, the the composition that John Williams came up for uh, Mutt's character, played by Shia LaBeouf, and, um, and, and the one that he came up for Spalco, played by Kate Blanchett. He, you know, if you get an Indiana Jones film, you're going to get new, great John Williams scores. I hope that will be the case with the fifth one uh, when it comes out. Steven Spielberg uh, is not going to direct the fifth one, but, you know, Harrison Ford, come on. You know, you can't do an Indiana Jones film without Harrison Ford, can you? I mean, they've done young Indiana Jones. That's fine. But hopefully it'll be good. Now, here's a good one, Ryan. Another musical question. Uh, can you name the song where... Harrison Ford cracks a whip in it. You know, honestly, I cannot. Well, the song that uh, Harrison Ford actually, uh, there's a whip cracking, and it's Harrison Ford cracking the whip. It's called, it's a Jimmy Buffett song called Desperation Samba. It's also known as Halloween in Tijuana from 1985. And uh, they they wanted a whip cracking, cracking, and they figured, well, if we're going to have someone cracking a whip, let's get Harrison Ford, which I think is good and logical. So, so they uh, brought him into the, to the studio to crack brought him a whip. Into the studio, and he did it. Yeah. So it's not like a sample from the movie. It's they brought no, Harrison. No, no, wow. exactly. They brought Harrison Ford into the studio. I believe and he he did it right there live. So that's. I'm sure that Jimmy Buffett and Harrison Ford had a lot of fun hanging out together. I would imagine. That's up so, there with but, Brian Wilson having Paul McCartney chew uh, chew on some vegetables into a microphone. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, and you just like you have no idea that it's Paul McCartney. Even And he even did that brilliantly. The Raiders score was recorded in February of 1981 at Abbey Road Studios, speaking of Paul McCartney. And um, it was performed by the London Symphony Orchestra, who had done uh, the Star Wars films, at least the uh, first two, I believe. And um, they certainly did the first one. And there's nothing like the London Symphony Orchestra. They are fantastic. And I, I think whenever I hear any film scores or, or film compositions and the London Symphony Orchestra is playing it. It always sounds better when they do it than any other recording. So they got to do Raiders. George Lucas, who will always tell you that making all the Star Wars films are nothing but problems and they're so hard, says the one good part is when John Williams does the music because it's just the whole thing comes to life and uh, you can just kick back and enjoy it. You know, when Lucas first screened Star Wars for his friends, they all thought it was a disaster and they thought it was terrible. When they watched it again with John Williams' score, it was a different movie. The film, the film director, Michael Ritchie, said it was a mind-boggling difference. He said the film was like so bad before, but then the score gave it this kind of feel of a serial, which it was kind of based on was the old serials, as was Raiders of the Lost Ark. And they're just great scores and, you know, ones that you can listen to over and over again. And all four films have got segments in them that are just uh, unique to that film 
and that I really love. I love the segment that he wrote for the opening of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, where you see young Indiana Jones and he's running across the train. It's, it's just a great, great music and unique. You don't hear it in any other part of the Indiana Jones film. They're just great stuff. Uh, one of the greatest compliments for John William is, I think, when a another composer takes the reins of you know, one of these movies in a uh, series that they still incorporate all of his themes. Oh, absolutely. And they, they will interweave them a little bit and, and do it. And, um, and John Williams has actually done that himself. If you see Close Encounters of the Third Kind, it's a brilliant score by John Williams. When You Wish Upon a Star is woven very subtly into elements of that score in the last uh, 20 minutes or so. So much so that if you don't listen to it, if you see later re-releases, they've done a few versions of Close Encounters of Third Kind, you flatly hear When You Wish Upon a Star over the end credits, but it's woven very subtly into, I don't want to give away what's happening in case anybody goes back and watches Close Encounters, but in the last 20 minutes of the film. So John Williams has done that a little bit. And he's incorporated some other things in 1941, he incorporates deep in the heart of Texas in a few scenes and and he does it so melodically. It's just incredible. It's just absolutely amazing. Well, I also wanted to bring up some of his TV work. Oh, yeah, absolutely. All these great composers started in television. He worked on Gilligan's Island of all yeah, things. Yeah, I had no idea. Yeah, I don't know if he actually did that created the theme song i forget if he did but i know he did you know some of the composing you know he started off as just a studio musician musician for many many years and just was scoring television like a lot of these guys did like jerry goldsmith did and wound up doing the twilight so jerry goldsmith that is and john williams just scored a ton of television stuff i can tell you one thing he wrote that i love he wrote two themes for the TV show Lost in Space. There's one that's kind of peculiar and it's it's kind of strange and that's very good. But the more lively of the two ones, that's like one of my favorite TV themes of all times. There were some great, great instrumental themes from TV back in the day. Let me tell you, I don't, I don't know if we get it as much nowadays. And no insult to the composers that are working here for television. I know a few. But, you know, John Williams wrote a lot of great TV. Time Tunnel, I know he did the Time Tunnel and there's been some releases of some of his television work as well. But I, I, he did some scores in the 60s, which I love. There's a score for a Dick Van Dyke comedy called Fitzwilly, which is just an outstanding score that I love. I know that Steven Spielberg also liked that score. And when they met, uh, John Williams commented that Steven Spielberg could hum melodies from movies that he had scored that he had forgotten, but he knew it. Some guy who told a story about going to meet Spielberg in his office at Universal very early in his career, I think maybe even before Jaws, and they were talking about a movie that they were possibly going to work on, and the guy started talking about the movie, and all of a sudden Spielberg jumps up and goes, hang on, i got to get my think music on. And he runs and got a, a score from a James Bond film and puts it on the record player in his office and starts playing the soundtrack on the back. And the guy was a little befuddled. Can you name the film where... Steven Spielberg plays a musical instrument on a John Williams score? Uh, I cannot. I am not surprised. It's pretty. It's a pretty obscure question. On the score of 1941, which is this another big heroic march and a great score, Steven Spielberg thought it sounded too good, and he used to play the clarinet in high school. So he ran home and got his clarinet that he still had and came in and played the clarinet the clarinet along with the orchestra just to rough it up a little bit. He said, it sounds fine. That's really him playing the clarinet. I'll tell you another thing about Raiders that uh, doesn't get talked about a lot in the, right after the Ravenwood bar burns down and Marion and Indiana Jones get on a plane and fly to Cairo. There is some stock footage. They didn't really shoot it. They took it from another movie of the plane flying over the mountains And that footage is taken from another one of my favorite films, the 1973 musical remake of Lost Horizon. Now, I I tell you that the musical remake of Lost Horizon is one of my favorite films. I love it. If it's just as Raiders of the Lost Ark is on the list of some of the greatest films ever made, 
the musical version of Lost Horizon from 1973 is always on the list of worst films ever made. Everybody's got a film that everyone considers to be a big turkey, but you just it just you respond to it. And for me, it's that 1973 remake of Lost Horizon. So it's uh, it's been derided and made fun of, but it has a core following people like me that love it. And some of the footage wound up in Raiders of the Lost Ark. Well, that's that's pretty funny. Yeah, it is funny. There's, you know, uh, and I think in every movie, especially any big movie, there's always something funny or something kind of fluky that happens. Of course, the great scene in Raiders where Indiana Jones is in the marketplace and he's going to have the shootout with the air or the uh, fight with the Arab sword, swordsman. They actually filmed it, but there's a couple of stories. One was that Harrison Ford wasn't feeling well because a lot of the cast and crew got sick when they were over and on the location overseas. And the other one is they were just blocking out and Harrison Ford said, why don't I just take out the gun and shoot the guy? Whatever. And however they came about it or why they did it, it's just a hilarious, hilarious scene. And, you know, that's what that's a, one of the greatest moments of the greatest lost art in Indiana Jones. And I remember the reaction from seeing it for the first time. Just the theater, just, you know, you couldn't believe it. It was so amazing. <laughs> it was, and, and you know, the theater, the National Theater saw it, and it was a huge thousand feet theater. But Raiders was great. I got lectured by my prom date, actually. We were going from the prom to the after party, and the prom was about the, the, a little before Raiders came out. She said, that movie's never going to be as good as you built it up to be in your mind. So... That's how much I was talking about it. It came up on prom night, right? Anyway, she was wrong and admitted so when she finally saw it. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we mentioned we were talking before we started the show about our mutual friend, Amber Ovilus, who does the intro to the show, correct? Yes. I remember watching Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade with her. And I pointed out one of the angles of the character of Indiana Jones. They originally wanted him to be a college professor, or at least George Lucas wanted to be a college professor, and then also this uh, kind of grave robber who went and got these antiquities. But he was also going to be this playboy that was always squiring women to nightclubs and that kind of thing. And Steven Spielberg and Lawrence Kasdan, I believe as well, felt that there were too many sides to the Indiana Jones character as it was with just the grave robber and the teacher aspect. But there's a scene in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, and I, I remember pointing it out to Amber, uh, when he, you remember, the, is the film pretty clear in your mind? Yeah. You remember the beginning when he goes and he hides from all the students in his class, in his, his office, or he at least goes in his office and he's about to, walks out and all the students are there and they all want his attention, they all want to talk to him. When he steps out of his office, all the students are vying for his attention but the first thing he sees on either side of him are two co-eds, and they're, they're both giving him this look. And he, and he kind of looks at both of these two girls, and then he's caught. You know, he's like, uh-oh, they're, they're meeting. You know, they're right here. And he kind of holds up his finger with, like, I'll be with you later. And I remember pointing that out to Amber and her kind of laughing because it's not like something that's real obvious. Obviously, it's real subtle. So uh, Indiana Jones was not above, I guess, a little dalliance with a co-ed or two. But um, so be it. I guess when you're Indiana Jones played by Harrison Ford, you can get away with that kind of thing. Especially yeah. in 1936. <laughs> so, <laughs> But uh, that's that that just showed the different sides of his personality uh, that they wanted him to have three of them all together. I think the original vision for Indiana Jones was he was going to be a little more immoral than he wound up. He kind of wound up being a hero and in Temple of Doom, he, you know, he's rescuing all the kids and everything. But he was uh, in part based on Humphrey Bogart's character in uh, John Huston's film, The Treasure of Sierra Madre, Frederick C. Dobbs, which is a great character, but, you know, very immoral. And he, that's a great film. And he has a fedora and he kind of looks like Indiana Jones, but they toned it down a little bit. And that's all kind of, you know, the development process and things change all the time. And then, of course, when you bring an actor into it, uh, the actor all is will bring so much to it as, as, as Harrison Ford certainly did. And there were some great actors that might have been Indiana Jones, you know, of course, the legendary story of the fact that they wanted Tom Selleck to play it, uh, to play Indiana Jones. And 
he was up for Magnum PI, but they hadn't really pulled the trigger and CBS hadn't picked up the show. When they got wind that Steven Spielberg and George Lucas were making a movie and they wanted this guy, they went ahead and kind of greenlit Magnum PI and that would have precluded him from being available for Raiders. Um, ironically, sadly, I guess there was an actor strike and the production of Magnum PI was delayed for three months. So Tom Selleck could have done it. He was available after all, uh, but kind of those kind of things happen all the time. Their original casting idea for Indiana Jones was they wanted to go with an unknown. Steven Spielberg said, we wanted to find a construction worker in Malibu and turn him into a movie star. And then he said, but then we couldn't find a construction worker in Malibu who could act. So they didn't want to go with uh, Harrison Ford because George Lucas had used him in two films, American Graffiti and Star Wars. And he didn't want to have someone that, as he said, was like his Robert De Niro, because Robert De Niro was in all these Martin Scorsese films. He didn't want to keep reusing the same cast over and over again. I think that all the great films have many elements of why they're successful. And if you were to ask me why Raiders of the Lost Ark is considered one of the greatest films made, one of the greatest adventure films, one of those elements certainly is John Williams' fantastic score. Yeah, I agree. So I guess randomly, I was reading about the legacy of the film, and apparently archaeologists... Yeah. <laughs> Easy for you to say. Archaeologists. <laughs> archaeologists, yeah. Yeah, archaeologists across like the country were furious that everyone thought that they just gallivanted around the world finding artifacts like this. Well, imagine how they would have felt if they would have shown them squiring daffinous women to clubs and whatever they wanted to do. It's funny you mention that because my friends who got to go to that special sneak preview of Raiders a couple weeks before, remember I had to go to my theater banquet <laughs> in high school, so I couldn't go. I remember specifically they came back and saw it, but there was a um, good friend of mine, David Green, who I've known since the first grade and still friends with him. He had gone uh, with his girlfriend uh, to see the movie that was playing, and they didn't see Raiders. They came after Raiders and stayed for the movie. I even remember the movie, The Four Seasons, an Alan Alda film. And he saw some friends, and they said, that this movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark, is fantastic. We just saw it, and you got to see it when it comes out. And so they sat down in their seats in the theater, and a the guy turns around and goes, I just saw this movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and it's terrible. It's all this stuff about the Ark of the Covenant that's wrong, and they got it so wrong, and, and blah, 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 blah. And the guy was outraged because they didn't get the, the facts of you know, the Ark, right? But it's you know, the kind of movie where you can play with the facts a little bit. I mean, obviously the Nazis are, you know, they're cartoon Nazis. They're not real Nazis. We saw real Nazis in what I think is Steven Spielberg's masterwork, Schindler's List. But, you know... It's you got to remember the origins, Saturday matinee serials and comic books and all that kind of great stuff. I remember my father, he didn't love Raiders. He kind of liked it, but he he had some criticisms and he was talking to an actor friend of ours uh, and he they both agreed that in those old serials, you didn't get to open the ark. You had like the ceremony where you were about to open it, but at the last minute it tumbled over the ocean and was lost forever. They never got to opening it up. So he didn't like that. I remember because the summer that it came out, you know, I was going to see Raiders with everybody. I had to go see it again and again and again. So I remember going with my father to see it. And in the scene where Indiana Jones climbs under the truck and then, you know, attached to the whip and climbs back on, I remember my dad going, Oh, no, 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 no. It was just too unbelievable. So Raiders of the Lost Ark on June 12th, it'll be 40 years old. Maybe we'll get lucky and the theaters will be reopening. They, for the 35th, I believe, maybe it was five years. It might have been even longer. They uh, came up with a Steven Spielberg supervised IMAX print of it. So a lot of IMAX theaters were showing Raiders of the Lost Ark in IMAX. Might have been for the 30th. I can't remember. But um, it was great to see it on the IMAX screen because it's great to watch these films at home, but there's nothing like seeing it on the big screen. Absolutely. And let me tell you something, Ryan. When you saw Raiders in a packed audience, when that boulder rolled down, the reaction from the audience was just something else. And 
I contend that uh, not only is Raiders a great film, I think that that opening of Raiders, the first 13 minutes, is the greatest opening of any movie. It's just fantastic. The idea being, because the old serials would always show you the previous Saturday installment uh, episode of what was happening, the ending of it, before they went into the next adventure. So the first three Indiana Jones films, Raiders of the Lost Ark and Temple of Doom and Last Crusade, all have a little adventure at the beginning that, of the film that open it up. That's kind of a wrap up of the previous adventure. Indiana Jones and the Crystal Skull doesn't have that as much. You see him get pulled out of the trunk of the car and he drops some pieces on the ground and they shatter, but you don't really know what they are. They kind of go right into the Crystal Skull story. If you read the novelization, they go more into what that's about. Um, I don't know if they ever filmed it, but it's not in there. But all, the structure of all the Raiders films, or all the Indiana Jones films, rather, is that you will begin with the ending of a previous adventure that you've never really seen uh, because they're not straight up sequels. So right. it's kind of interesting. And that's where those great openings go. But that opening of Raiders of the Lost Ark, which is 13 minutes long, is just extraordinary. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I didn't think of it that way, but that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that's what it was. That's exactly what you're watching and what they intended it to be. And of course, the truck I was talking about that he climbs under is at Disneyland. When you get off the Indiana Jones ride and you go off, that actual truck that they use is right there at the exit. And so that's kind of neat. And there is an Indiana Jones bar called Jock's Hangar at uh, uh, Disney Springs in Florida, Disney World. Uh, it's not heavily Indiana Jones themes, but it's very subtly Indiana Jones themes. For example, you'll look in the bar and they will have the little um, voodoo doll from Temple of Doom when they made the little Indiana Jones voodoo doll in it. That's mm -hmm. there. And there's a few other things. It's Jock, Jock Lindsay's hangar based on the pilot that you see at the beginning of Raiders of the Last Ark at the uh, end of that great 13-minute opening where Indiana Jones hops on the plane and gets away. And we find out that he hates snakes. So. so there you go. Give me, Ryan, give me your ranking of the Indiana Jones films. What are your favorites? I think Raiders is one. Yes. Then I think I have to go Last Crusade, then Temple of Doom. And I don't, I've ac actually haven't seen Crystal Skull. Did you actually not see it or did you just block it out? Um, I did I'm not kidding. see it. I think I heard about the <laughs> nuke the fridge thing and I was like, ah, I'll watch it some other time. <laughs> Listen, it's you know it's got some it's got some good things in it, and there's no terrible Steven Spielberg film. He's just he always infuses things. Harrison Ford's always great. It's fun to see uh, he and Marion Ravenwood back together again, uh, and Kate Blanchett's very good in it. I'm kind of in a minority. Uh, I know I have one friend at least that I know agrees with me. I like Temple of Doom better than Last Crusade. I think the set pieces are great, the score is great, and I I liked it a lot. Uh, you know, I like I liked um, Last Crusade as well, but I like Temple of Doom better. Okay, fair enough. I mean, they're all pretty close. I think Raiders is the classic, right? Because it's the first. For me, Raiders is classic because he uh, he's a he's a real guy in it. He's almost a cartoon character in the other one. That's fine. It's kind of funny. I th I always felt that the other two film, oh, well, let's say two films, Temple of Doom and Last Crusade, at least because there was such a long gap before Crystal Skull came out, were more like what they originally intended Raiders to be. They wanted Raiders, at least George Lucas did, to be kind of on the cheap and kind of like those old Saturday matinee serials were made. Steven Spielberg at the time said that it was very, it came out slicker than they really intended it to be. That was his exact words. <clears throat> I know that he wanted it to shoot or at least he said it deserved it. He wanted it to be in the old Academy ratio, which is what many films up until the 1950s were. In fact, all of them just about when you watch an old film, like let's say the wizard of Oz and there's the black bars are on the side and it's almost like a square in the middle of it. That's the Academy ratio. He thought uh, Raiders should have been shot in that. He didn't really want to shoot in widescreen. He said he was forced to shoot widescreen. I don't know who forced him. But he did say that at the time in an interview. And, but he said it's a lot slicker than they really intended it to be. So that's kind of interesting. And sometimes these things come out a little bit different than anybody intended. The sound also, you have to talk about Ben Burt and his great sound design. And I know for the 30th 
I attended a screening with some friends at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, and they had several people who worked on the technical aspects of the film. And this was the restored version that they did for the 30th anniversary. They did a, a new restored version of the film, and um, Ben Burt was there and talked about it. And, you know, the sound effects are amazing. Ben Burt's, of course, the great sound genius that Lucas discovered right when he was coming out of USC film school when Lucas was directing Star Wars. But it's interesting that George Lucas has given us these two franchises that were largely inspired by old Saturday matinee serials, Star Wars and Indiana Jones. And the only reason Star Wars came about was because George Lucas wanted to get the rights to Flash Gordon. He liked those old serials and he wanted to do that, but he couldn't. They were tied up. And Dino De Laurentiis, of course, ended up producing a Flash Gordon film in 1980. So Lucas, not being able to get Flash Gordon, decided, well, I'm going to write my own. And so he constructed Star Wars. At the, about the same time, this is going back to about 1973, when he had finished his great film, American Graffiti, he came up with the idea for Indiana Jones. And the, and the inspiration for Indiana Jones was he saw a poster of a guy, a horse leaping onto a truck. And he thought it reminded him of those old 1930s serials. And of course, that image wound up in the film. It's the start of the truck chase. You see Indiana Jones ride on the horse down the hill and then hop on the truck. I did at one point, Steven Spielberg put the Indiana Jones fedora on my head and watched me do my Indiana Jones invitation for him. So that was all. <laughs> oh, <nice>. Wow. <laughs> so that, is, that happened. So <laughs> he just happened to have a fedora <laughs> and he was. It was when I told him it was the anniversary and he didn't know. And he goes, here, I got the hat right here. And he put it on me and I go, hey, you want to see my imitation? And I did it for him. <laughs> so it was kind of funny. You know, uh, it, it's I love the fact that that film has not aged. And, and it's just so much fun to watch, especially that first 13 minutes. For me, since we're talking about personal stories of the film, it reminds me of a time when I was graduating high school. And, um, you know, I wanted to write and, and do all these other things. And I, uh, you know, really didn't know how I was going to go about it. I knew I was going to go to school in the fall and I didn't really have any kind of plan. So looking back 40 years later, here we are. Uh, I look back at some of the uh, things that have happened. I've, I've been fortunate enough. And people I've met and friends I've made. It's been fantastic. And whenever I do watch films like Star Wars or Indiana Jones or any film I love, I go back to that first time I saw it. You know, I re and I remember the crowd reaction. I remember the reaction of whoever I was with. And so it's kind of like time travel. David Lynch, the great director, has a wonderful saying. And I think he was talking about The Wizard of Oz when he said it, which is some movies are like places that you love to go to again and again which I think is a great saying. Yeah, I agree. That is great. There you go. Well, Peter, thank you for coming on the podcast. It was my pleasure, Ryan. I hope I wasn't too verbose. And it was just great to be here and get excited about Raiders of the Lost Ark again. Are you going to watch it for the 40th anniversary? I absolutely am. Are you going to play at least the Raiders March, if not listen to all the soundtrack? Yeah, absolutely. This was a great time. Um, is there anything that you want to plug? Any projects that you're working on? Uh, well, since we mentioned our friend Amber Ovulez, she is uh, a wonderful voiceover actor, and she's one of the uh, lead characters in an animated project that I'm producing called Adventures with the Caretaker, along with some other great actors. And talking about the music, has a great music uh, scored by a wonderful composer named Adam Gubman. And working on that, I'm also doing a documentary on the preservation of movie theaters called It's Only a Movie Theater, which has kind of come about at an interesting time with the theaters closed and people wondering with streaming and, and um, things like HBO Max is releasing things right away, what the future of movie theaters is going to hold. And um, I don't think they will ever go away. I, I mean, Ryan, if the movie theater opened tomorrow and it was completely safe, would you not go out to see a movie? Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's a it totally like different experience. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So those are the two primary projects. And, you know, writing scripts and showing them around. Of course, a lot of the live action stuff has slowed down. But who knows? Maybe I'll end up 
uh, writing uh, the sixth Indiana Jones film. You never know. So <laughs> I'd be happy to do it, but I'd also be happy to get a tub of popcorn and go see it as well. Well, very cool. Thank you, uh, Peter. You can check Peter out on Instagram. We'll plug that for him as well. And, um, you know, have a good night. I hope to have you on again. Oh, please do, uh, Ryan. I really enjoyed it. And thank you for having me. And thank you for a, a wonderful show celebrating soundtracks. It's just great. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us this week on Soundtrack Your Life. Make sure to visit our website, SoundtrackYourLife.net, where you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. While you're at it, if you found value in the show, we'd appreciate a rating. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too.